Hi, my name is Steve Hawks. I'm excited to share this presentation with you, Engaging Students Through Study Abroad, a topic I'm very interested in and excited about. Um, I'm Steve Hawks. I'm here because I believe in the power of study abroad programs to engage students in ways that create lifelong impacts. I've been doing study abroad for over 20 years to a large number of different countries. I currently teach in kinesiology and health science department in the brand new Master of Public Health program with an emphasis in health education and promotion. I teach a couple of global health classes in the program and I really wanted to bring study abroad into the MPH program as well. Hence my interest in, in this topic in particular. Uh, Mary Dwyer and I agree wholeheartedly, study abroad positively and unequivocally influences the career path, worldview, and self-confidence of students. My experience in higher education, my, the highlights of my career have been study abroad. Some of the lows have been study abroad. It's uh, challenging, difficult, hard to make work successfully, but extremely re rewarding both for faculty and students when, when it works, when it's done well. Theoretical foundations, ingredients of success. Let me, uh, I should have been commenting on some of these slides. Um, this is um, students in Thailand a few years ago. And uh, working with a nonprofit organization that provided services to homebound elderly people. Um, this is in Cambodia a few years ago. Um, with students I have some photo bombing in the background there working at a, a, a rural school for low-income students. So great experiences. This is uh, back in Cambodia again. I'm um, doing health education, uh, personal hygiene presentations with a local um, student. The, the student in this image, USU Eastern t-shirt, Navajo student from Blanding, amazing um, thing to watch um, someone from rural Native American uh, reservation teaching rural um, individuals in Cambodia so very fun to watch that play out theoretical foundations this is with a student uh, earlier in my career in in Manila um, outskirts in an impoverished area actually doing a, a research project in this case so conceptual framework at the individual level, we, in my discipline, we try to change behaviors, quit smoking, eat better, manage stress. Um, but rather than come in with our agenda, let it be driven locally within the training level of our students. Don't put them in situations where they're asked to go above and beyond what they've been trained to do in a culturally sensitive way that's sustainable rather than one and done and, and do something useful, but then leave them hanging work to make it a sustainable program. Don't forget we have the same issues at home. At the program level, it's all about uh, partnerships and um, working with entities within the country that want us there, that value our resources, that use our resources to build capacity. Um, and then at the social level, understanding the broad policies, regulations, national conditions, protocols, resources that are in place in relation to whatever our discipline is, whatever we're trying to accomplish. So it's extremely helpful to take a step back very early in the process and envision where your program fits at all these different levels, um, at the individual level, the program level, the social level, and craft a program that makes sense within that broad context. And then the five essentials of any good study abroad program, strong, clear academic content, competent faculty who have a grasp of experiential education, service learning principles and so forth, integrated into the local um, community with, with a host organization that really wants us there, that contributes to the lectures, and then working with the students throughout the program and after the program in terms of reflection and what have we, we learned. In terms of the host country lecture, I have never had students believe what I'm teaching them more fully 
than when they hear it from a host country lecture. Even if it's the same thing that I've been saying, it, uh, they believe it when the host country lecture says it. So putting all these pieces together becomes important. Setting the curriculum stage and now getting down to the point of what exactly are we gonna do? Um, the academic focus is it topical. My area is public health, global health, and so it is topical, and yet within my discipline, we appreciate the nuances of culture. We, we our intent is to be interdisciplinary, multi-sectoral, so it ends up being all, all of the above to an extent, but it's probably pushed by the discipline. Um, Faculty-led programs lend credibility, expertise, added value to a program, so faculty-led is our preference in tandem with a local instructor that can bring the local perspective into play with a strong partnership, building those relationships. Where are you gonna go? Um, how long are you gonna be there? What time of year are you gonna go? And again, making it faculty led. So thinking through all of these aspects of what makes the best possible program. And for us, we did a pilot study with our MPH students and some of the slides that we've seen are from that group and we'll see a couple more. Um, who are our students? What are they thinking? What do they want out of a study abroad experiences? After coming back from our pilot trip, we created a Qualtrics survey. Question number one, do you really want to do, do you want to have a study abroad experience as part of the MPH program? Not surprisingly, the majority of students said maybe, um, but the next largest group said absolutely if we can work it out. The next largest group Probably, but I need, you know, I need to work out the details. So all that's fair enough. That gave us enough of a green light to say, yeah, there, there does seem to be interest in doing a study abroad program. So um, how long do you want to be gone? Most of our students are non-traditional with families, working full time. There are definitely time constraints. Again, not surprisingly, the majority said two weeks. Um, some said three weeks, some actually said four weeks. So we're probably looking at a two to three week program for our next outing, which will be next summer if all calms down in the world and, and travel is possible. Where do you want to go? And I only list the places that I'm comfortable in going, that I've had experience going, Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa. And interestingly, I don't, I don't know why I haven't had a chance to explore this, but the majority said they want to go to Asia which is especially interesting right now in light of COVID-19 and where it originated. And there's been some great examples of Asian countries that have been extremely effective in how they responded to COVID-19. So there's certainly a lot that we can learn there. What type of credit do you want academic content, which is what we did the first go around. Um, we had a, a, a course, all of our site visits were related to that academic content. Afterwards, the feedback from the students was we're grad students in public health. We want hands-on, we want practical, we want to get our hands dirty. And, and so not surprisingly, they said, give us uh, practicum credit, which is also a core part of the program. So in our next adding, that's what we'll try to do. Final question, when do you want to go? Um, first ranking was immediately after spring semester in May, which is when we've traditionally gone. Um, second choice was right before fall semester starts. Third choice was during the winter break. Um, in light of this, I'm, I'm suspecting that we'll stick with May. We put together a steering committee of MPH students to help plan the next outing, so it'll be very much student-driven and faculty-supported, which tends to make a stronger program. So the process, um, all of what we've been talking about is really on the planning side, Put it in that broad context, make sure you have the essential elements there, and then begin to build the curriculum with a lot of student input. Once you get to that point, then marketing, actually doing the study abroad, and then that evaluation loop, bring it back, get, get input from the students and from the instructor, what worked, what didn't work, what can be done better, and continually refine, refine the program. Jessica will talk about some practical examples of some of these steps in her upcoming part of the presentation. And then go out there and do it. Uh, this is our MPH group um, in Thailand last year. We went to a 
psychiatric hospital and as we visited uh, different areas of the hospital, we came across the multi-sensory room students or the um, individuals that were doing karaoke and our group was invited to come up front. Um, our star singer, um, non-traditional student, family uh, back home, full-time worker in public health already, couldn't get the mic away from him, did not land a recording contract, but had a great time. And those are the kinds of experiences that you remember and, and really helps you bond with students and gives them experiences that they're probably not gonna have in any other way, at least not as part of their academic career at USU. So that's my part of the presentation. Thank you and Jessica, take it from here. Hi everyone, my name is Jessica Ruscha and I work at the Utah State University Blanding campus. I have my master's degree in international development and I am currently a doctoral student in my last year for my doctor of education. I have been involved in international service work for the last nine years and I have been part of study abroad programming with Utah State University for the last five years. I am here today because I believe service learning engages students and connects them to different levels of humanity. Now, as you start to develop your proposal or thoughts of developing a faculty-led program, I believe it's important to determine whether or not you are ready and equipped to either launch the program through Utah State University solely, or if you believe that connecting and partnering with a nonprofit or an organization is the best method in delivering your program. Um, the last five years, I have been part of a nonprofit organization called YouthLink. They are located outside of Salt Lake City, Utah, and we have partnered with them and created a program called Global Community Leadership. And we want to make sure when you're partnering with organizations on who best fits your program goals. For the programs that I have been leading, I focus on the service learning um, aspect of it along with the curriculum. And so YouthLink coming in and already having established relationships with nonprofits, with Rotarians from different countries, they have the establishments and the resources that I was looking for. So for my program, it made sense to partner with YouthLink. So as you're developing your proposal, it's important to look and see if other agencies or nonprofits are um, going to match what your program goals are. Now marketing for the programs. Um, Granite, as soon as you get your proposal approved by the study abroad office, they will start marketing for you. So they will create a brochure with your information such as how much the cost is going to be, what the curriculum will look like, so what the courses are. And so my best advice is um, utilize the study abroad office as a resource to help you market and recruit for your program, but also start early. So if you can um, make a presence to be at least to the study abroad fair in the fall at the Logan campus and the study abroad fair in the spring. Um, those are great times to get students, especially the students targeted at the Logan campus. Um, I would also encourage you to get involved with other program events and utilize social media platforms. Both of those are great opportunities to start marketing your program and then getting into the recruiting aspect of it. So the earlier you start your marketing, the better. Um, since the deadlines for proposals are in September, if you could start early or mid-fall semester, um, that starts getting the students prepared financially and mentally for your study abroad programs. All right, recruitment. Um, I have three levels of recruitment that I like to focus on. So your departmental, your internal and external and your statewide campuses. So within your department, um, utilize your academic advisors. They are fantastic resources to help market and recruit for your programs. I, um, the program that I lead, I teach two courses. So I offer a USU 2160, which is a leadership course and then a HEP 5250. So it's a global health course. So I focus on both um, students in general, but then with my academic advisors in the kinesiology department, then I'm, I'm targeting them. Um, fellow professors, it's always great to contact another professor, see if they are willing to allow you to come and speak in their class or maybe talk to students after the class. And then I have made presentations similar to this Zoom 
uh, pre-recordings and professors have uploaded it onto their Canvas page for me. And that's a great way to be able to start getting students thinking about your program and showing that there's support through that. Um, the other aspect of recruiting is think um, not just students, right? So you're going to want to see if faculty and staff are wanting to go. Um, of course, you are the sole faculty leader unless you have a co-leader. Um, but it's a, such a great opportunity to have faculty and other staff members available who can serve as mentors and support systems as you lead these international. Although I know not all programs will take trips that um, are large enough that they will need other mentors or faculty and staff. Uh, but the trips that I take usually have between 15 to 25 participants, and that includes faculty and staff members. Um, the other thing that you will want to do when you are recruiting, dependent on if you are doing just a Utah State University one, or if you've partnered with an organization such as YouthLink, if you are allowing non-USU participants, I have had participants who are parents or siblings of Utah State students, and they have experienced this study abroad opportunity together. I think last year we had probably four parents, siblings that had come onto the trip with fellow Utah State students and that was exciting to see. So make sure that you know what, what population you are wanting to target there. And then finally, statewide campuses. Uh, I have heard from several statewide students that they're not sure that they can participate in some of these opportunities because they're not located at a certain campus. And so I really like to keep it broad and allow students across the statewide campuses. I have in the past contacted director of students or associate vice presidents and asked them if they would market events for us. Last year, I actually did a statewide tour where I contacted students in advance and worked with um, academic advisors, the associate vice presidents, director of students. And then when I went to a site, I was actually there being able to meet one-on-one -on -one with a student. If a student ever contacted me, then I didn't travel to that site. Um, that way I was able to start creating a relationship with the student and answering questions with them. Um, of course, this year it will look a little bit differently, having more virtual options due to the pandemic and the mitigation plan that we are trying to do. All right, so scholarships and fundraising. The One of the number one things that I hear from a student is, this sounds amazing, how much is it? And so the first question they're gonna ask is the cost. Um, I really like to reassure students that there's lots and lots of resources, but it is going to take effort on their half. So we as faculty and staff can get them part of the way and with the efforts that they put in looking into scholarships and doing fundraisers then they can get the rest of the way. Um, I have always given students my contact information so that we can work through this as they're getting accepted into the program and so I follow the students through the application or before the application through the application and then upon to acceptance. So the three main things of um, coming up with the costs for their trip are scholarships, um, if you're partnered with an organization, what funds they have available, and then of course individual fundraisers. So scholarships, there's university related, um, depending on where the students are at uh, financially and which campus they are paying tuition, there are some opportunities to have um, scholarships that refund, so they over award and they allow to refund to the student. And so that's a good time for students to actually start saving or setting some of their money aside to start paying for their trip. So for example, with the partnered organization that I work with, YouthLink, they create a social fundraising platform, um, kind of like GoFundMe, where students can pay at any time. Um, they can share it across email or social media. And so YouthLink creates this social fundraising platform in which students can start fundraising in October, November, December, and that way they have seven, eight months to fundraise rather than two months, three months to, to get their money coming in. So it's great to start early on the process of getting students to think about start paying for their programs. And then finally, individual fundraisers. One of the best things that I can tell students to do is to start letters. And the letters are just stating, here's why I'm going and here's how it's going to benefit me. And then giving them the information of how to donate that money. I have also, uh, 
given students a letter of support from my behalf if they are taking it to corporations or to other businesses to donate. Um, Group-based efforts are always great if they are willing to get with fellow students who are also going to study abroad, they can fundraise together. Um, individual based is great as well. And then of course, host venues. Uh, we have been lucky at the Blanding campus where students can utilize some of the facilities at low cost or for free. But helping connect the students to those venues is really important in helping them fundraise. Okay, pre-departure preparation. This is so important because it helps with retention and it helps students feel competent on going on their travel. So we have done any topics from how to get your passport to um, does your country need a visa, traveling healthy, making sure you are smart with your backpack, with your bag, um, being flashy with things. Um, cultural competence is such a huge aspect of it. And so we, what I like to do with my program is meet once a month. And by meeting once a month, starting in December, the students start to get familiar with their team, with a faculty leader, with other staff or faculty mentors who are on the team. And then we start our plans um, with our international service projects. So pre-departure preparation is really critical. The study abroad office does offer a pre-departure orientation that they do in the spring, sometime between March and April. But I think it's important to start earlier, especially for the students who are first time travelers. All right, if you are thinking about launching a study abroad program, you can do so on the study abroad website. And um, you can see here the proposal is due by September 1st if you are leading either in the spring or in the summer of 2021. Um, Monica is the study abroad director. You are welcome to reach out to her, or if you have any questions, you can reach out to uh, Dr. Hawks or myself. Uh, I will be going next year to, well, Jamaica was our, our planned course for this summer, but it was postponed to December. So we are hoping to travel to December. So if you are interested and we do not postpone again, we are still um, open enrollment on that. And then I am planning to take a Cambodia trip again in either May or June next summer. And thank you so much for being part of this presentation. We love study abroad. It is something that both Dr. Hawks and I are very passionate about. So if you have any questions about how to develop a program, um, thinking about one in the future, or if you would like to be a member on one of our teams, we would love to have you. You can see our contact information here and let us know if you have any questions. Thank you.